All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, September 15th. We will be hearing the presentation, Smartphone Photography. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown there in bold. For your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box, again located in the webinar toolbar, and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2017. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. If you're looking down the list and you don't see your chapter or division listed, we ask that you reach out to them and suggest that they join us. Today's webcast in particular is sponsored by the Urban Design and Preservation Division, which we'll hear a little bit more about in just a moment. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your MyAPA account. Then you can uh, search for CM activities there on the screen, and you can do so by either typing in the event number or the title of today's webcast both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education, and you can check those out on our webcast webpage, again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date info uh, on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel after the end of the session. Just head over to YouTube and type in Planning Webcast, and uh, we will pop up. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Margaret Rifkin of the Urban Design and Preservation Division to kick things off. Margaret. Thank you. Again, this is Margaret Rifkin. I'm the web webinar coordinator for the Urban Design and Preservation Division, and my most important message to those of you who have not already joined us is please do, please join our division. Uh, we also encourage folks to send in ideas for webinar topics, newsletter articles, or simply get in touch with us to volunteer. Next slide. <laughs> well, this is the fourth in our 2017 webinar series uh, sponsored by the Urban Design and Preservation Division. The next one is on November 3rd, Path is Place, with Cindy Zerger with Tool Design Group, and we hope you'll be able to join us for that as well. Next slide. Today, as uh, Chris, point, Chris explained, um, today is smartphone phone photography. Our Expert is Elodie Creamy, who is with the Maryland Photographic Workshop, and also she's the prioritizer of Devante Photos, which is a photo studio in Arlington, Virginia. She's a very experienced instructor and has taught a variety of courses, including smartphone photography, and we're delighted to have her. So, so take it away, Elodie. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you, Christine and Margaret. Um, hold on one second. Main screen. Show my screen. Wait a minute. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm excited to be leading this webinar on smartphone photography and hope that everyone enjoys the briefing and will have some really good takeaways. Today, for the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I plan to cover four main topics related to smartphone photography. First, I will review all major photography features of both the iPhone as well as the Android slash Galaxy phone 
recognizing that there are many different models and features associated with each film. The second topic presented will be composition. How to see better, how to be more mindful of what you see, what to include, what to eliminate, what to shoot. Recognizing that these are only guidelines, not hard and fast rules. But these guidelines do provide a great way to help you get started in thinking about your subject and how you can creatively make a uh, better image. Uh, the third topic that I'm going to cover will be peripherals. Um, some good ideas for lenses um, that you could add, tripods, et cetera. And you know, just some cool stuff that's out there that can uh, help you with your photography. And finally, um, I'll have a discussion of the editing features of the iPhone, similar to the Android, but unfortunately I only have time to talk about one. And also some really fun uh, photo apps that can be used to take your uh, editing beyond what is offered by the smartphones themselves. Uh, before we get started, I want to show you a few images that demonstrate why the smartphone has become so popular with so many people. The technology isn't perfect and will take some time before it will truly replace the professional DSLR cameras. But the, qual the quality of the images is pretty good and the fact that you can carry a smartphone in your pocket definitely reduces the burden of size and weight of your suitcase and on your back. So on to the first topic of the webinar, the photo features of your smartphone. I'm going to start with the iPhone first and then move on to the camera features of an Android phone, specifically the Galaxy S7. And here we have the iPhone. Um, here's an image of the iPhone camera screen showing us a lot of the basic functions. If we start up here in the upper left, you'll find the volume buttons, which can also be used as secondary shutter buttons. Coming across the first icon that you're going to see here then is your flash control um, icon, then HDR function, which I'm going to explain in, a, in greater detail as we go along. Then you also have here the uh, live um, icon for shooting, the self timer, as well as then in the upper right, the selection here for um, filters. Uh, in the middle, this is the actual viewfinder screen. And then coming down to the bottom, you have the uh, gallery or where you can view your photos, the shutter release. And then finally over here, you have your um, reverse camera, which is uh, your selfie phone. Continuing on, if you were to swipe this area here, starting on the very left, you would have um, your option for time lapse. And then moving across, you have um, the opportunity to do slow motion followed by video, your uh, standard photo option, square photo, and then finally uh, panorama over here. And then if you have an iPhone 7 Plus or um, will have the new iPhone 8 Plus or iPhone X, you'll also have a portrait option to choose from. And then also on this slide, uh, you'll notice that both uh, focusing and metering for exposure are mentioned. To co control both of those, what you need to do is select the area you want to focus or control the exposure by tapping on the viewfinder screen. We're also going to discuss this in uh, further detail in a few minutes. Okay, on this slide, um, the first thing you see mentioned is, is HDR or high dynamic range. This option is wonderful and great to have in your bag of tricks, especially when you're in a situation where one click of the shutter cannot capture the full dynamic range or exposure of an image. For example, if there are a lot of shadows and or a lot of light coming in through a window, the camera really doesn't know how to properly expose uh, for that situation. So if you were to select HDR, the camera will take two images, one, overexposed and one underexposed, and then merge them together, combining the best of both images and giving you a much better result properly exposed. And I have some examples coming up this soon as well. And I really don't think I need to say uh, too much more about the other feature that's showing on this slide, which is um, 
the camera view alias the selfie button. Um, here are a couple more uh, functions that are great to have. The first is your control for flash. There's the auto option for the camera to make the decision of when the camera thinks it needs the flash for additional light, or the option for you to override the camera's decision and turn on the flash in a situation where you want to add more light. For example, say you were taking a portrait of your daughter under a tree in daylight. The camera lights, it really likes the existing ambient light and doesn't flash because it says everything's okay. But because there's a slight shadow on her face, say coming from the tree, you want to override the camera's decision and then turn the flash on. Two other uh, features or functions on this slide include live right here. And that's when you want to add a couple of seconds of video or animation to the beginning of your um, still photo. And burst down here is where it's called continuous shooting. And it's great for situations where you have movement, whether it's people, water, trees, etc. All you have to do is activate the, the burst feature is to hold down your shutter release for as many seconds or as many images that you want or that you think you need to capture the perfect shot. You can then review the images and select only the ones you want to keep and then throw away the rest. And for basic, very, very basic shooting options, there are nine different options of tones, although I don't think any of them are really that great. In addition, I always suggest that you shoot pure and make any tonality adjustments in the actual editing mode. Otherwise, for example, if you were to like say choose your choose your image in mono, you would never be able to bring back the color. And also notice on this screen over here that the filter icon is made up of three gray circles. Once you've made a filter selection, that icon will turn into three colored circles of red, green, and blue. It will stay that way for the rest of your photos unless you turn it off by opening the filter and then hitting selecting this one here called none. And then finally, the last icon that we see on this iPhone is the gallery or view button, view buttons uh, button. This is the button you hit to get your library of images so that you can edit them, create albums, add to photo streams and or share online, email or text. In recap, uh, for the iPhone, here's a list of nine important features of functions that are fundamental for the use of the iPhone's camera. I'm going to follow this list with examples that explain or show what I mean in greater detail. The first is the ability to swipe to the left, just real quick, so that you have quick access if the phone is locked. I call this the 911 function for emergency photography. The second is the camera grid. This is a very important tool for one of the first rules or guidelines of good composition, the rule of thirds. To turn on the grid, go to settings, then photos and camera, and then select grid to turn it on. A third great feature is the burst mode, to be able to shoot continuously by holding down your shutter release. The fourth is the ability to set both your focus and exposure. You're the boss, what do you want to have in focus? Then the fifth uh, most important feature is the option ability to lock your focus and exposure once you've selected them. That way you can re recompose your shot as well, knowing that what you've selected will remain locked. Next on this list is the fantastic opportunity to take HDR photos. Keep in mind they won't be as great as what you can do with a DSLR camera where you can take up to nine or even 16 different images at different exposures of the same subject. But just the ability to have some control over your exposure when you can't get the shot in one click is great. The seventh feature is the option to take photos with both of the volume buttons, along with the option to use your Apple headphones using the volume control as a cable release to shoot photos. And finally, Number nine is the avail availability and option to tag your photos with the geographical location of your shots. 
I found this very useful when we were at a different place every day for six weeks in Australia and New Zealand, especially with some of the crazy names in the very remote places we were in. I would have never been able to remember or been able to match up the locations with the photos if I didn't have the geotagging feature turned on. To do this, you need to go to settings, then privacy, and finally location services, camera, and while using the app. So in a little bit more detail, this is the grid. This is what you'll see when you turn it on in your settings. You'll notice that it divides the screen into nine even sections, very useful for the rule of thirds and composition. You'll notice that here's your main subject who is in this intersecting quadrant. And then going one step further, the second focus of, of the second uh, subject that you want people to be looking at is also divided in thirds. You have your sky up here in this uh, top third, then you have the ocean in the middle third, and then the bottom third, bottom third is your sand. I'm going to be covering the rule of thirds along with more examples in the next section of this um, webinar. And then this is a, a slide that shows you um, in detail where you go to turn your grid on. And then here's an example of an image that was shot using the burst feature. There are people walking in two different directions, and it would have been really tough to take this image with just one click. By continuously holding down the shutter button and obtaining seven to 10 photos of the same scene, you will have a greater chance of capturing the exact image you were thinking about. And then the ability to override the camera's decision of what it wants to focus on is very important. In this example, you notice that the camera chose to focus on the background instead of the daffodil in the foreground. And then the same thing is happening here. Notice this yellow square in the middle. That's the area and the subject where the camera automatically wants to focus. By overriding the camera's decision, decision remember, you're the boss. If you tap on the screen over the area that you want to focus, the yellow box will now move to that area. And the same is true for exposure. If there's an area that's important for you for the exposure, you would move this, that same box to that area. Unfortunately for the iPhone, both focus and exposure are tethered together. So at some point, you have to accept the best that this feature can do. Also note that once you have selected the focus and exposure area, if you continue to hold your finger on that yellow box, you'll get a message at the top here that says, AE slash AF lock. You can then remove your finger and the lock will stay on. And one more thing, if you notice, see this little sun here to the right of the box? If you move that up and down, you can control the exposure even more, down for dark and up for light. And then this is the uh, final image that shows the flower here on the left. That's the one that is in focus. And then the other two flowers, the one in the middle and the one on the right, are much softer and not in focus. And as I explained earlier, high dynamic range or HDR is a great feature to use when you cannot capture the correct lighting or the exposure of an image in one shot. Here on this first shot, the camera has overexposed the image, trying to capture the detail of the shadows. And then on this second shot, the camera has underexposed the image to capture the details of the highlights, in particular, the light coming through the door and the open window. And voila, the final image, the best of both, bringing us the sparkle of the highlights and the depth and details of the shadows. Just a footnote, this image was also post-processed in Photoshop afterwards, but only to give it a more arty feel. The HDR, itself, the HDR effect itself wasn't really compromised. Okay, so onward to the Android, of which there are many manufacturers, models, versions, etc. Since this webinar is very time limited, once I talk about a few basic features of an Android on the next slide, I'm going to use the Galaxy S7 as my demo model for the rest of those slides. So 
here are some of the basic camera functions of an Android starting in the very lower left. Here's your gallery or library icon to get your images. And then you have uh, the, the selfie icon toggling the camera from front to rear facing. You also have the opportunity to uh, toggle the camera in dual mode so you can shoot two images at the same time, both of the front and the rear camera. You have a very important um, feature here that your quick settings uh, um, icon or your cog, which is gonna take you to a lot of options and features. And as with the iPhone, you have the opportunity to tap on the main screen so that you can get control of the focus and to be able to control what and where you want your focus to be. Uh, this next little icon simply tells you what your current mode is that you're in. Then uh, your icon for recording video uh, to capture your photos, your shutter release, and then a very important button, which is your um, the mode button, which is gonna take you to a ton of options. And then this is the screen that you would see for a Galaxy 7. Um, similar to the iPhone, you have a lot of the same features. If you start, I'm gonna start on the left here. This is your um, effects or filters icon, then your ability to turn HDR on or off, your self timer, your um, icon for flash. And then uh, the next option is something I like and not available, at least on my iPhone success. And this is the ability to choose the size of your image, which also impacts the quality of your image. And then here's your little guy here, the, um, the cog for your settings. Coming over here to the uh, upper right, this is your uh, gallery or library to get to your images, your video record button, your, um, your shutter um, release, and then your icon to uh, go between back and forth the, the front and rear camera, and finally then your, your mode button right here, get my arrow over, sticking, is your mode button again. Um, if you were to click on that mode button, this is what you would see. Um, from what I understand, you do have to download um, most of these um, modes via an app first. They don't come necessarily with the camera. And then what you see, there's your auto button, your, um, uh, where the camera's gonna make all the decisions of exposure, focus, light for you. The pro button, uh, which allows you to make most of the decisions. You have uh, the opportunity for selective focus, allowing you to make additional decisions about what is in focus, what is not, panorama, et cetera. And this ne next slide, oh my God, it goes into real detail of what each of those mode buttons are. I'm not going to go through them in detail because I did cover the first four, but um, I think that you have the opportunity to come back to um, these slides at some point if you really wanted to um, capture more detail, or I can send um, anything that you want uh, to you, if you ask. Um, anyway, for now, I'm only going to discuss the pro mode and the value it provides in creating a better picture uh, for you than the auto mode. So this is the screen you would see if you did click on pro mode. Starting with the upper left, you have a button for multi-auto focus points. Then you have the um, exposure meter here. Uh, which allows you to make a decision. Do you want to meter the, uh, an average of the light for the whole scene, or do you want to just meter the center of the, um, the image? Then you have the uh, self timer, flash control, followed once again by the image size, image quality um, button, and then the settings cog. Now, coming over here, you see, um, you have, this is your filters uh, button and selection, and then you have the opportunity to, coming down, you have the opportunity to auto a manual focus, uh, white balance, the opportunity to change your ISO, to change your shutter speed, and also to change your exposure compensation. I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about some of these selection features. The first are the filters. And so if you were to click on this icon here, this is where it would give you the opportunity to have all these, um, uh, have a nice selection of filters to choose from. 
And then if you fit going down the line, if you wanted to have better control over your focus, you can uh, click on uh, this icon here and it will allow you to uh, manually focus and adjust the uh, slider. And it's really, really good for macro work where you really need to have control and have very fine detailed uh, focus. The next item you can adjust if you want is the white balance or a color temperature right here. Uh, normal color temperature for daylight is 5,500 Kelvin. Auto mode is usually 90% accurate, but sometimes, especially if you have light sources coming in a, in a room that are coming from, um, like say, for fluorescent light, incandescent, and natural, the balance will be off and you need to go in and uh, adjust the uh, color temperature. And then <clears throat> you also have the opportunity to adjust the ISO or what I call the sensitivity of the light hitting the sensor. ISO goes back to the film days. If you were shooting in daylight, you could use, say, ISO 100. But if you were planning on shooting in a dark room or a wedding that didn't allow flash, et cetera, you'd need to have a higher ISO, perhaps 400, 800, 1600, to capture that darkened room. So, but the problem with higher ISO numbers is that you will get some noise and the image won't be maybe as crisp or sharp. But you do, luckily, have the opportunity and option to also adjust the shutter speed. So I would recommend doing that first. For example, if you're shooting outdoors on a cloudy or dark day, you would need more light than you would on a normal sunny day. So you would need to shoot at a slower shutter speed to allow in more light. Or if you were to shoot a bird in flight, you'd want a faster shutter speed so that you could capture and, uh, and freeze uh, the subject, his wings, etc. And then finally, over here on the left um, is the picture size. This is a feature that will allow you to choose what size you want to shoot your image based on what the final output will be. If all your images are going to be uh, posted on Facebook or Instagram, for example, then you could shoot at the lowest quality size uh, you know, down here, which would give you more memory space on your um, phone. And as we had discussed with the iPhone, you'll want to turn your grid on. Uh, this can be found in the settings or the cog um, function, at least on the Galaxy phones. And um, just to make a point, um, as you're looking for your, your grid, recognize that it's not screen grid, which is used for aligning the app icons on your, um, on your desktop or on your screen. Um, so just to make a point there. And also under camera settings, under, right underneath grid lines, that's where you can also um, turn on your uh, geotagging location uh, for your images. And then uh, one more setting that you really might want to consider is the RAW feature. I think that's so cool that you can do this with a phone. Raw filters that you probably have heard of um, are very important when you intend to do some, you know, very serious editing. You're going to blow up the images to a large file, etc. You are capturing all of the data and all the details of the image, and the photos are not compressed as they would be with a, say, a J JPEG file. Each photo will be saved as both a raw and JPEG because you cannot see or edit the raw files without downloading a viewer, a viewer app. So um, the JPEG quote copy will be used for you initially to see the images that um, you have taken. So to recap, the nine most important features of an Android, or in this case a Galaxy phone, is first the, uh, uh, the wonderful opportunity to adjust white balance, picture ratio size, shutter speed, ISO, and metering in the uh, pro mode. Um, you have a grid that you can turn on to aid you in composing your image using the rule of thirds. You can shoot in raw. And in pro mode, you can also, you have a selection, selective focus feature that gives you more flexibility in controlling what areas you want to focus. And uh, even in auto mode, you have the option, similar to the iPhone, to select and lock your focus and exposure. 
You also have the option to shoot in HDR. And in addition, you can use geotagging of your images if you want. Another great feature is Best Photo, similar to um, the burst or the continuous shooting that you had in the iPhone. And then finally, you have drama, sound and shoot, and animated photo options that you can select and play with. So now on to a fun section. This is um, called Guidelines for Composition and How to Create Great Photos. The first, and I'm going to call these guidelines for composition. They're not really rules, but you know, the first one that you've probably have heard of if you have ever taken a basic uh, photography class is the rule of thirds. And that's where you're dividing your screen into thirds, both horizontally and vertically. And that's what the grid that you have now set on your camera will um, look like. And it really is great because it really allows the photo to be more balanced versus if the subject is just smack in the middle of the screen. And it's also going to allow for greater impact to your viewer and allow them to interact more with the image um, much more naturally. And these are three more examples here where the main subject is in that um, intersecting quadrant. In this case, this is not to be, they're all in the, the lower right but you have the opportunity to put your image in any one of these intersecting quadrants, or even um, the image itself could just be in one of these uh, horizontal or vertical um, sections. And then just one more example where you have a lot of um, um, emotion and energy in this image, you've got the subject who is over here in this uh, intersecting quadrant, and then you can feel um, almost feel the motion as we're as she's getting ready <laughs> to take off. Uh, and one more example of using even color to help in the rule of thirds, showing the poppy amongst all these uh, pretty little um, pansies. Another good guideline is called leading lines, and this is where you're creating a natural path for your eye to uh, follow. It's going to add depth to your image and you're providing a natural line uh, to draw your viewers into your subject. And here are some more examples. Now, this leading line, it's not even in focus very much, but it's still your eye starts on the right side following the line into this beautiful flower and this little bug or fly that's here. Um, this is an example of a leading line where actually, I mean, I got down very close to the ground to uh, to really get engaged um, with this um, walkway, and I'm able to you know draw the viewer in around, bringing you back here, looking at the signs, the people, the smog here coming off of this boiling arsenic and sulfur volcanic boiling <laughs> junk, and then you come around again. You keep coming around in a circle, but it's the leading lines that are bringing you in. Um, this uh, also you have a plank that uh, is taking you from out here in the water down to the boathouse. You start looking at the little homes, come around, and then the leading lines keep bringing you into the um, into the image. Another example um, where you have your leading lines coming in, bringing you to the back. You start looking at uh, these different pillars. You want to keep going around and looking at more things each time that you, uh, your eye is uh, transitioning back and forth from the back to the front. And then this is an image, uh, just a, a quick, uh, uh, I use an iPhone app called Handy Planet to, uh, to create the swirls, but it's kind of fun where your eye is coming down the walkway and then you've got these circular lines that are continuing to keep you um, engaged in the photo. Uh, another good guideline is to um, be aware and be mindful of what's going on in your background. I mean, here we have our main subject is this boy. And the photographer, uh, it'd been nice if I uh, paid attention a little bit to the girl here because we want to know a little bit more about her and if she really should be part of the image. But the fact that her, her face is cut off is kind of bothersome. So 
In this case, it had been good for the photographer to either ask the girl to become more engaged, get more involved, come closer to the boy, do something, interact with the boy, or remove her from the image, or um, change the, your position, change the photographer's position so he's including her in. And then also there's a couple other things that, that bother me a little bit. We got a little piece of trash here. And then we also have the back of um, somebody else's shoes. So these are the kind of things when you're looking through your viewfinder to be more uh, careful of and to notice what's going on in your um, background. This, and here's another example. You have two cute boys playing chess. It's a very, very nice, fun image. But look, you got this branch coming down that's landing on top of this child's head, and it's kind of distracting. As a photographer, that's the kind of thing that you should notice and either remove the branch, change your position, do something different so that um, you don't have a distraction in your, um, in your image. And this one overall is very good. You have two cute little girls enjoying and, and smelling these beautiful little flowers. But this, you have this tree back here. And by changing your position as a photographer, you could easily get rid of that, that tree and just include more green uh, grass in your um, background. So what I call it is be mindful of your monkeys. If you want your monkey, if you want a monkey in your photo, have the monkey in your photo. If you don't want the monkey in your photo, please ask him to move, get out, or recompose the shot so that he is not included. Okay, um, another guideline would be what I call symmetry and pattern. And this is where you are capturing a, re a repetition of a pattern. Um, you can show scale or break in the pattern, but it's a really great way, a very easy way to appeal to the eye of your viewer. Uh, very useful with travel, architecture, and interior photos. And here are some examples. Um, this is where you have a repetition of pattern with the pencils. What's kind of cool too is you also have leading lines. All the pencils are bringing your eye into the center and to the points of each of the pencils. And you almost have rule of thirds going on in here. Not quite, but, but very close. Here's another example of a uh, repetition of shapes of, of these barrels. Also included is um, the leading lines, bringing your eye to the back, and then your eye comes back. You're, you, you hit this uh, bucket here, then you start going back, looking at the barrels again. Maybe next time your eye looks at these barrels up here, next time you come around, you might notice um, the plugs in the actual um, barrels here. But repetition of shape and leading lines. And don't be afraid to get close. Fill your frame and embrace your subject. You know, get, show more detail of your actual image. Uh, don't be afraid to show us the butterfly, to show us the detail of the flower. Um, don't be afraid of dude. He's not going to hurt you. But it makes for a really much more interesting image when you are more intimate yourself with the subject, whether it's your, your dog or even your child, to really, really get us close and very uh, engaged in your subject. Also, to be mindful of uh, whether you should shoot um, vertically or horizontally. A lot of times I, I might shoot both ways and then choose later which um, image I like better. Uh, in this case, they both work pretty good. I think I like this one better on the right side, the horizontal, because I do have a little bit more detail with these rocks in the uh, foreground. Same thing here, neither image, I mean, they both work fine. This is a, a, a cart that belongs to um, a coconut vendor down in Costa Rica who um, has, at the end of the day, and you stop for a moment. And so, um, you know, it, it works as an image, but I like this one better because not only do we have the cart, but we also have um, some people in the image, we have more of the tree, and we also have um, this, this island out in the back, so in the background. So um, this ends up working better. And like I said, that's why sometimes I just end up shooting both ways and decide later. But this is not a cropped image from the horizontal. This actually was an image I shot separately. 
And then perspective, um, what your point of view, how do you see your subject? And um, what I tend to suggest, what I, what I often suggest is to take five or six images of the same subject. When you come up to something that you think is really, really exciting, go ahead and take that image first because the subject might leave, something might happen that you'll never get it again. So go ahead and take it because that's what you saw, that that is what attracted you to it. But then maybe take uh, four or five more uh, images, same subject, but go around it. Go take a shot from the left, take a shot from the right, take, get in back of it, get below it. Because what it might turn out to be is that very, very last shot you take is the one that's the most exciting because you did become more engaged. So think about being the worm, the being the bird, you know, get on top of a chair, find a different way to approach your, your subject and make it more exciting to your audience. Uh, this particular uh, Ferris wheel in this image, you have the rule of thirds happening here where you've got this center cog of the entire Ferris wheel um, right in that rule, right in that intersecting quadrant. And then you have your leading lines, which is bringing your eye around in a circle to look at all of the different um, components of the uh, Ferris wheel. But, you know, shooting from below, not just straight on. Same thing here, you, um, you now have the point of view of the photographer himself looking down on this uh, grate. And in this case, you have um, the point of view of what it's like to be inside the tent, looking, you know, waking up in the morning and looking outside and this is the view. And don't be afraid to look up. You never know, you never know what's going to be up. Uh, and you can get some really, really cool images, whether you're, you're uh, in a forest looking up, if you're um, on a beach chair at the beach, uh, looking up at the coconut trees, um, you can get some really fun images this way. And whether you're underneath a bridge, and also uh, the perspective in uh, you know, shooting another dimension, looking through something and including it in your foreground just to once again make for um, you know, a, a more exciting image. Same thing here. So um, one more final would be, you know, thinking also about your lighting itself. Uh, where are the shadows? And is there something that you can do by either moving your subject or moving yourself so that you can uh, perhaps eliminate some of the uh, existing shadows? Okay, hold on one second. I'm going to just take a sip of water. Um, on to the uh, third section, which is really fun. This is, um, I'm going to talk about um, peripherals and some things that you can add to your um, iPhone, your Galaxy, or any of your Droid phones to uh, take some, some different images that you can do otherwise with your camera lenses. So the first is the Allo Clip 4-in-1. And you can see over here that it does slide over both the front and the, uh, the rear camera. Um, and you get the opportunity to have four lenses. You have the fisheye and your wide angle. The two macros are underneath these two lenses, so you would just screw them off, and that's where you would get your macros. Um, the quality of the glass is good. You get some very nice images, but the problem I have found, and I don't use mine anymore, is because when you put it on your camera, the I have a screen guard and it rips it. And I've gone through two or three screen guards already. So I prefer not to use this particular lens for that reason. You also have to take off your case, which for me is a, a pain in the neck. Um, Photo Jojo, these are uh, very good lenses. The glass is good. Um, I really like them a lot. The way you apply them to your um, phone, though, isn't so cool, is that they actually have an adhesive magnet that goes around both the front and the rear lens of the camera. And then when you go to put the lens on, it snaps to that uh, magnet. The only problem is if you're walking along and you were to, to whack your camera against a table 
or accidentally hit it against something, these little lenses could fall off. So um, that's a risk that you're taking in, in either losing the lens or, or damaging it if it fell off. So which brings me to the third um, lens, which is by Gear Up. And you can buy these at CVS, Best Buy, et cetera, usually at the front counter. And these are, now they're plastic lenses, but they're okay. And they're really, really fun to work with. You get three lenses, a little velvet bag. You get a clip that uh, goes on to either the front or the back of the lens. And this works for pretty much any phone that's out there. So if you keep upgrading your phone, you don't have to keep buying a new set of lenses which is what you have to do with that very first one I showed you, the Olo clip. Every camera, every phone requires a new set of Olo clips because of the uh, lenses because of the way it adheres to your um, camera. Now, if you really are interested in having a very good quality tripod and selfie stick, I recommend the iClip which I bought from the Apple store, but I think you can just get it on amazon.com or, or any photo online store. What's nice is that you do have a tabletop tripod that you can also make taller by using this extension tube here. If you want to have it, use it as a selfie stick, you would just take off the, the tripod feet. And you also get a really nice little remote control all for $50. Once again, at CVS, I think you can get a tripod for probably $12.99. That does pretty much the same thing, except that you don't get a remote control and the quality isn't um, nearly as nice. If you, needed ex if you needed additional lighting, say you're doing some uh, tabletop work and you needed to uh, illuminate your subject, I recommend the Manfrotto um, LED lights. Most of the time, you're probably are going to maybe need two of these, shooting both or using the light on both sides, the left and the right, to give more, um, a, give a balance of light on your subject. But the quality of this light is very good. It's very bright. You notice that um, you have a little extension here. These are filters to use if you um, had fluorescent or incandescent lighting. You needed to balance. Um, the light in the room. You have the option to put the uh, light itself also on a light stand or a tripod. Now, if you don't want to spend $70 for one of these lights at CBS, <laughs> you can buy um, a little light for $12.99 and you can flip it to either the front or the rear. And this provides a, a lot of light for you. Uh, it does go into the uh, headphone jack, which mm, after I think the iPhone 6S is not available. But you know, I'm just throwing this out here right now, just so you can see that you know there are other options besides spending seventy dollars for a light. Okay, now I wanted to spend a little bit of time going through the editing features of. I'm, I'm going to just do the iPhone because that's all I have time for and then show you a couple of apps that are out there that are very, very fun, exciting, and they're the favorite ones that I use. So first, when we're editing with an iPhone, um, and I'm gonna walk you through this, so we really don't need to, to look at the details of this um, particular slide. Um, the three apps that I'm gonna show you would be Handy Photo, which you can buy for $2.99 uh, one-time costs, and then that's it. Uh, Camera Plus, this is the one that I really like the best for their camera because you have some options that you're going to see that you don't get with any of the other um, apps or even the phones. Uh, and then Snapseed is free. And this is, this is very robust with all the features that um, it offers. So give me a second because what I need to do is to flip over to my um, phone itself. Here we go. Let's see how well this all works. Okay, you don't want to know about North Korea at the moment. 
All right, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go into um, my, my gallery, my library of my iPhone, and I already have an image ready to roll. Um, and you'll notice that we have over here in the lower right-hand corner, I'm going to say duplicate, and I'm going to edit that. Okay, so that's where I made my selection to get into the editing um, features. And the very first icon I have is the ability to crop my image. I can uh, rotate it as well, et cetera. I also can go in and these are those same filters that we had available um, when we were actually choosing to shoot. Discard those changes. Then I also can come over here, and if I want to adjust my light, my color, if I want to make the image black and white, I can do that. I'm going to hit light. And by coming over to that icon that I just hit, it gives me the opportunity to adjust only the shadows, okay? Or if I want, I can adjust just the highlights. If I wanted to go ahead and change the actual brilliance of the image, I can do that. And let's see, let's come back to there. And then if I want to go into color, I have first just nine selections that I can just slide back and forth or hit this icon again. And now I can specifically go in and adjust the saturation. I can go in and adjust the contrast and the, the cast. And then if I hit black and white, I go to slider, I can make some adjustments, but if I want to go in and actually do some really fine adjustments with the tonality, okay, or with the intensity, et cetera, the grain, I can do that. So that's what's available with the iPhone editing features of your actual um, camera, which isn't bad, but at the same time, um, not great. Because we now have apps that we can use, of which there are many. As I said, I'm gonna go into Handy Photo first, and I'm flying through these, so, because um, I know I only have, what, about 50 minutes to cover everything. Um, Here's my, here's my little parrot again. And if I go up to the hand, that's why I call it handy photo. This is where I have an opportunity to go in and I can adjust my tone and color by clicking on these different uh, icons down there. So this one is going to be my brightness. And then I can keep coming around my warmth. Remember that I can change my color of the, the color temperature. If I come back up, I can actually go in and I could uh, retouch if I just simply want to uh, take away part of the, uh, you know, fix up, heal, do whatever I want to do to that particular image, I can do that. I would hit the checkbox in that lower right to accept my changes, or I can come back up here and I can go back to my original if I didn't like the changes I had made. And then coming across, and I'm skipping over most of these, I have my filters that I can go in if I wanted to give it a sketchy look or if I wanted to change the contrast. Um, Tiny Planet, that's the one that I used for that um, one shot of the, um, of the gym vignetting. I can also um, do framing. So if I wanted to put a frame around my image. So really quick, sorry for, for rushing through this, but uh, I want to get to the others. Camera Plus in particular, uh, this is the one that I really, really, really like it for the camera itself. Because first of all, excuse me for moving this too quick. If I hit that plus sign, I have a macro feature, okay? Or I can, uh, let's get back out of that. And then also for, I'm trying not to move this, you guys, sorry. <laughs> um, this is where I can separate my focus from the exposure. See right now, the two are together, but then by holding it down, I can now separate them 
And so my exposure area, that's what I want. Oops, sorry. My exposure area I want, come on. Why is that not moving? So I can separate the two. The focus, if I want, I can adjust this way. And then my exposure, I can also go in and, okay, I'm trying to do this live and it's not always working great. And I can also adjust my <laughs> exposure and here I can also change the color temperature as well. So that's what's really nice about Camera Plus and I don't wanna make you dizzy here. So let's go back into our cool little bird and I'm going to edit him. And just show you real quick, I have going across this, um, the yellow, the tannish color band here, I can um, select different options. Say if I had a, some food, this is supposed to emphasize and give some good detail to food, but I can go down here to my lab and make actually my own adjustments uh, in much more detail, whether I want to to blur the image a bit, if I want to tint it. Um, I have that opportunity as well to change the intensity. Um, I have a lot, of, a lot of good features. This is where I also have a lot of filters, way more than I would have with my iPhone. And also then for frames, I have a lot of options here for, for my different frames as well. So that's, it in a nutshell for camera plus but i really love that as a, a um, camera the last app i'm going to show is snapseed and this is the one that i i really like a lot because it has a lot a lot of tools that you can work with starting with for example to tune your image if you drag your your um drag down from top to bottom this is where you get all these options that you can change. So if you wanted to change just your shadows, and now I'm moving my finger across left to right. Okay, and then I just hit the X to get out of that real quick. Um, but it, or if I want to change the brightness, once again, go back and forth. I um, add my options to crop, which they're giving you either preset cropping, if you wanted a, um, you know, a certain ratio, or you can also crop uh, freeform. Thrush is really a, a wonderful tool because that gives you an opportunity to selectively um, change the exposure, dodge and burn, to change the temperature just in one particular area. So in this case, I have dodge and burn selected. And if I was to come up to the eye, you can see that only that area that I'm painting over with my finger is light. And then I can come down a little bit and I get an eraser that I can then erase parts because I only want just that eye to be um, overexposed or ha have more light to it, et cetera. But um, wonderful opportunity to also say even change, so again, the saturation. See how I just want his, um, his body to be saturated, but I want his beak to stay a little bit more muted. And then once you're done with working with all the tools, oh, and one that I like too is the uh, details because that's where you can actually go in and sharpen your image. And that's one that I always use, especially after I do any editing to uh, my images. So anyhow, after you've used the, gone through all your tools, made all your adjustments and changes, then you come to all the millions of filters that you can use to um, enhance or change your image. So if you wanted to give it a really grungy look, or if you wanted to give it a more of a glamour glow, which you're, you're giving it some blur, um, drama, lens blur, et cetera. And then finally you get to frames and that gives you the chance to change the framing going around your image as well. So that's it in a nutshell, really quick for all the apps. And now I'm gonna to try to get back to my slideshow. So just bear with me for a second. Um, play from current slide. Okay, and then these are additional apps. Once again, I can send you this list if you want. 
of apps that uh, I really like and enjoy, but just a did not have time to go through all of them. Which brings me to the next slide, asking a simple question. Are you ready to start shooting with some of these um, tools? Usually what I do in um, any class that I teach on smartphone, we have about 20 minutes where everybody has the opportunity to go out and, and shoot and then come back in and we show the images and talk through them. So these are some of the suggestions that I usually give to the students that they can, um, can try out. And it's all related to the guidelines for good composition, where in like say the first example, you're showing a person um, in their occupation or one of your classmates using the rule of thirds to go ahead and take the same image, um, both as the, a normal shot and then as a bird and a worm. This is usually one of the most favorite and fun ones to work with. But then also showing leading lines, symmetry and pattern, taking the photo horizontally, vertically, et cetera. So these are just some great um, exercises that you could do at any time to really help you um, see better. And then the next slide is just uh, some suggestions and, and creative guidelines in um, taking a shot just in general is to you know, start out to, to visualize, to really think about uh, what it is that you, you want to um, shoot to evaluate the situation, to, to look and experiment, to do evaluation again one more time, and then go ahead and take the shot, coming up to the fourth um, final step, which is to review, to improve, to think about what else you could have done. So, da-da! <laughs> uh, now it's time for you guys. Um, any questions, uh, please, um, Go ahead, and I'm and I'm ready. Okay, here and, we go. And and just FYI, here here's me. This is me. <laughs> this is who's been talking, and um, uh, all my info. If you did want to follow up afterwards, and I'm going to take a sip of water again. <laughs> sure, take a break. Mm. Okay, okay, I'm ready. Here we go. <laughs> So first question, what settings do I need to change to record a short video and send it? When I try even one minute of video recording, the file size is too large to send. What size? Is that what they're oh, what, what setting do I need to change so that they can record a video that's oh, you know oh, longer oh. than a minute long so oh, they okay. can send it? To tell you the truth, I really don't work with video much, so I, I'm not sure. I mean, I can follow up with that question. Okay, sorry. Um, That's fine. I can I can easily answer it, but I, I don't work with video. Okay. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, next I, I think anytime it, it gets over, you know, um, 10 megabytes, uh, and I'm thinking of images themselves, it, that is when it really becomes a problem, and that's where you're going to have a, um, a, a problem. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, ah, this is interesting. Planners take lots of pictures of tall buildings. Is there any way with a cell phone camera to correct for the perspective shift as you tilt the camera upwards to capture the building from the ground? Okay. Not when, not when you're shooting, but definitely in um, some of the apps, you can correct that. Um, for example, in um, Snapseed, they do have a vertical and horizontal uh, option that will allow you to straighten up the building. Okay. Great. But not a, not an actual not an actual shooting. I mean, you you do the best you can with the angle that you're coming from. But uh, but luckily there are apps that that will help you with the perspective. Okay. Okay. And um, I recommend Snapseed. Could you uh, quickly just review one more time the the apps that that you went through? Which ones are um, for the iPhone and which ones are for the Androids? Yeah, they're they're for both. They're really almost all these apps you can get for both uh, platform for or for both phones. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. And, and the question, are they going to be able to get a copy of this or do they, does everybody come back online or should I, you know, have available just things I can send out afterwards? Um, the, you, you'll be able to download, or I'm sorry, uh, view 
the presentation on YouTube. Okay. Um, and if you want to, we can also post this PDF on our web page. Um, so if you want to add additional resources to the PDF before sending it to me, you can do that. Sure. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, and towards the very end of your presentation, you uh, spoke about dodge and burn. Can, can yes. you explain what that means for those that don't know a lot about photography? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is um, what used to be done in the traditional um, dark room, where if you had an area that um, was too too light and you wanted to add make it darker, you would actually burn in. And then if you wanted to um, take away, like, like say you had an area that was too dark to begin with, you might want to lighten it up, then you would um, dodge it. Okay. Um, does that help? Yeah. Or do you want me to? Okay. Let's see if, if, if they have any other questions. They can, okay. they can type those back in. <laughs> um, okay, so the next one is, and again, if you have any other questions, because I think this might be our last one, um, you can type them in the chat box on the webinar toolbar there. Um, so this this question is, do you know of any apps that can erase a background so that the background can be white, for example? Um, definitely in Photoshop you can do that, and that's one of the really good um apps that are out there. I mean, you don't have to have the full-blown version on your computer. You can do it on your phone itself, and that would allow you to do that because uh, you can you can select around the image that you want to keep, okay, and then you can erase that background and put in a different layer of any color, whether it's white or blue, but you can, um, or, or put another image in back of it as well, and that would be with your Photoshop. Let me go back. The Photoshop Mix and Photoshop Express, the very last one listed here. Okay. Okay. Um, and can you um, tell us, on average, how much some of these non-free apps cost? And is it no. like monthly or just a one-time no. only? One time. One time only. So the the two that I mentioned, the handy handy. Um, photo and, and camera plus are $2.99 but you never pay anything more and then looking at this screen here uh, Visco and Instagram are free I think frame your life is free so um, you yeah, know they're, they're really not bad and it's not a monthly charge at all now okay um, what do you feel is the best app for panoramic photos especially to help with that bending perspective oh once again thinking i'm thinking snapseed snapseed is good because once again you can correct that distortion but i can i'll look at some others too i could follow up that question okay okay I think it's just so so wonderful that with all the phones now that you can shoot the panorama to begin with. But I understand what you're saying about the um, the, the curvature sometimes. Uh, I automatically go to my go to Photoshop on my computer and fi fix it that way. I just crop out or adjust with different sliders. But uh, um, I, I can check into that a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, next question is interesting. Do you uh -oh. know of any? Oh, no. Well, no, it's it's, a, it's an interesting question. I just don't know that you'll know the answer to it. Um, do you know of any software that can estimate the height of buildings from a photo? Oh, no, I sure don't. <laughs> I didn't think so. But it's a good I mean, question, isn't it? <laughs> I don't mind looking looking for that answer. <laughs> <laughs> so for those, for those well, couple I questions that are, make sure you just follow up with her. Yeah, I, that, yeah. In this industry, I understand that. Yeah, that would, that's a very good question. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. What's what's the next one? Um, I noticed that you had Adobe Lightroom on your Mac when you were uh, switching things around there, and he says I'm comfortable with Photoshop, but don't know Lightroom as much. Do you have? Do you see any advantages? Uh, of using Lightroom over Photoshop? Um, ab absolutely. Um, Lightroom is really, really good for organizing um, your your photo library. That's the first thing. Is it's, it's, uh, It has some very, very good tools, and that is what you should use 
to, to manage your actual images. You can also go in and do a lot of upfront editing um, so that you can go in and, and do your color correction and your cropping and your you know, little, little adjustments first. Photoshop, and then you can bring the image into Photoshop, and that's where you can do your heavy, heavy duty editing, where you're actually going to do composites and layers and, and really fun and arty stuff. Not to say that you can't do that in Photoshop, because you can, but the, the way that Adobe is, um, is um, not creating, but um, working with these programs now is that they, they're suggesting to start with Lightroom first and then bring it into Photoshop. Okay. Does that help answer yes. the question? But there's, you don't have to have Lightroom. I mean, I, you, can, you can use Photoshop for absolutely everything. You can use your bridge. That's what you use to uh, um, initially look at your images before you even bring them into Photoshop. It's, some of it's a personal choice, too. OK. Um, could you please talk more about features that allow you to take images in an emergency, like when there's something great happening in a plaza and you don't have to get the shot uh, right away and your phone isn't even on, you know, so when it's just absolutely instant, what is the one thing that you should think of? Because that's all the that's time the, that you have. That's the, that's the slide. That's the start in the right side and just swipe swipe to the uh, left and um, that gets you that brings you to your camera right away this is on the iphone um and that way you can quickly get your your emergency photo my husband's always like how did you possibly get that shot so quick and i'm like <laughs> i dialed 911. <laughs> okay um you can tell, i mean i i don't know on the on the galaxy phones um i can follow up with that um I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can with the Gallic, with the Androids. <laughs> sure. um, oh, someone typed in that the Easy Easy Measure is a free app, and it's like a laser tape measure. It can be used to measure distance via the camera, and it's called Yay. Easy Measure. And um, I guess there's another one called Stanley Smart Measure. Oh, by the Stanley guys. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, thank you, Kelly, for looking yeah. that up. Uh, <laughs> um, great. So another question, uh, do you know of any apps that correct uh, fisheye in pictures that were already taken? Uh, Photoshop, the Photoshop mix of Photoshop Al Express. At least I, I know for sure you can do it with the full blown version as far as the app, um, probably. Okay. Okay. Um, do you know of any aftermarket geotagging tools for older Androids? No, I sure don't. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, and we got a couple people typing in that uh, FYI on the galaxies, um, you just double tap on the power button to open the camera, apparently. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, let's see. What else? This is good. We're all working as a team here. <laughs> yeah, right. And then some models of the Android, um, if you just shake it twice, the camera pops up. That's unique. Wake, wake, wakes it up, okay. <laughs> um, um, okay. Uh, another go. question, what are some ways to stabilize uh, your phone in a pinch without a tripod? This is where I always suggest using your body as a tripod, okay? Where, and, and it's unfortunate you can't see me do this, but I, I tuck in my arms very close, tight to my body, um, so that I have more control and, and can hold it at, at a very low shutter speed. Or for example, um, you know, when I'm down on the ground, down on one knee, um, then I can tuck my arms on top of my thighs, on top of my legs, and use, once again, my body as a tripod. Um, another suggestion, just in general, is if you're standing, to have one foot in front of the other, okay? Don't just stand straight. Don't have both legs next to each other, but put one foot in forward. And that also gives you 
more uh, stability, keeps you better balanced, and you won't um, waver as much. Or if somebody was to bump into you, you're not going to knock over. So I usually recommend, you know, just thinking of your own body as a tripod and giving you good um, support. Otherwise, leaning against a building, you know, finding something else that you can um, rest either the camera on, um, et cetera. But I don't have any other, um, you know, there's no other tools other than that. If you don't have a tripod, finding whatever's available that you can use to rest the uh, camera on. Okay. That's a long answer. <laughs> Um, another question, uh, what are some, when you're using some of these apps, what are some good guidelines to use to avoid over manipulation of an image? Ah, uh, uh -huh. what, you know, it's a very personal choice. And I do think of, you know, like the, for example, HDR, you're, you saw that one example where I merged um, both the overexposed, underexposed, brought them together. It looked very nice. But then I manipulated a little bit more to give it a little bit of arty look. But in HDR in particular, that's where you can tell right away if something has been overprocessed, overdone, because it, it'll have, have that really grungy look. And so, I mean, yes, it is a personal choice, but I try to keep it as pure and as natural and as realistic as possible. So um, I don't know if I'm really answering the question, because it is a personal choice, but you, you kind of know when you get to that point where it, you, you're just, you've over-processed it and it doesn't look real anymore. And, um, and usually you can tell right away when somebody's done that. I mean, I, whether it's iPhone images or you know, with, a, with a camera itself, that, um, oh, fix now, um, where there's, um, where too much has been done to it. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have any additional tips for the compositions of landscapes? Um, the person asking the question said that's what they find they take a lot of pictures of. I know you talked about, you know, the rule of three and things like that, but do you have any other additional tips? When shooting landscape? Um, if you have Usually, um, if this was like a DSLR class, I would suggest to have, you know, like a very small aperture and all that. You want to have everything in focus. Um, you want to pay attention and be mindful, even with a landscape of your what's happening in the background, et cetera, making certain that what you want in the image is is uh, is going to appear. You don't have any any monkeys or uh, any any other things happening, people in the background um, that, that shouldn't be there, you know, to, to just be um, engaged in what it is that you're, you're shooting and make certain it's as clean and as pure as possible so that you don't have to deal with it in editing um, afterwards. Um, and even in, in landscape, a lot of times I might shoot in uh, HDR so that I can, um, and when it's merged together, you have a much nicer image because the the, the sky is going to be um, you know, much bluer. Your the detail of the landscape itself will be much punchier. You'll you'll be able to see the the depth of the shadows and that nice sparkle in the highlights. So I do recommend shooting in HDR in landscape. So you're picking out you're you're capturing all of the um, the detail. Does that help? I think so. Could you quickly again define HGR? Yeah, a uh, high dynamic range where where you're pulling out the um, you're, you're shooting um, several in images with the with the iPhone or the galaxies. It's just two overexposed, underexposed. Uh, if you were shooting with a DSLR camera, you have an opportunity to shoot more, all at different shutter speeds, all um, pulling in as much detail as possible. So, but you're so you're actually capturing the full range of tonality and I guess structure of the um, image. Okay, um, and it's becoming very popular. I mean, I, the new iPhone. 10 that will be coming out soon 
that apparently it's the the screen display itself is going to what they call um, super retina, but it's also going to have that HDR look. They're actually using that that word for their screen. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, it's fine. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the benefits of separating the focus and metering locations in an image? Sure. Um, I mean, there's some times where, say, you want the foreground, you've got your, your flower, for example, you want that to be very sharp and in focus, but there might be other things going on in the background that um, are, are darker, but you want to include them in the image. So by separating out the, the focus icon from the exposure icon, you can control both. You can, um, you, you have the wonderful opportunity to keep the focus directly on that um, flower and moving the exposure around to, to adjust that. And that's the one thing the iPhone you can't do. You can't do that. And Margaret, I guess you, you said that you can do that with the, um, the galaxies. But luckily with the apps, like for example, Camera Plus, that really, really is a great option. Okay. okay. Um, I think um, we'll maybe take two more questions. Um, one, this is, this is interesting. What is a source of a good smartphone camera review? And how often do you find you upgrade for your camera? Oh, good Lord. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was Margaret asking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> believe me, I go to them all. And I spent a lot of time in the last couple of days trying to decide, do I want the new iPhone uh, 8 Plus or do I the 10 or wait or go get a Galaxy? So um, there's a lot. I, I rely heavily on CNET, uh, C-N-E-T. Um, that, that's definitely one I go to, but to tell you the truth, I go to a lot. I go to the blogs. I, I, what was interesting on the apple.com um, uh, site, they were getting some, they were getting kind of slammed on, on some of, uh, by some of the, uh, reviewers. And so that, I thought that was interesting the other day, but, uh, I, I just, I, I go to a lot. Okay. okay. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and um, wrap up here because I've been drilling you with questions for about 25 minutes now. <laughs> That's okay. Some I answered, some I didn't. So. Yeah, no, it was great. Thank you. So, um, again, everybody, we're going to post uh, a video recording of this on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. Um, and then, Elodie, I think you're, you're going to add maybe a couple more resources to this PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, sure. And then send it to me, and then I'll post it, um, and it'll be available on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So we'll assume that that'll come up uh, sometime next week. And okay. um, I'll post on Facebook when everything is, is loaded and up so you can uh, check it out. So, uh, Elodie Creamy, thank you for joining us. Uh, Margaret, I know you're in the background there. Margaret Rifkin of the Urban Design and Preservation Division, who is our sponsor for today. Thank you. And everyone, have a great weekend and go out and take some pictures. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Christine.